Hi, Adam here with some quick admin, then we'll get right to this week's episode of Dice Punks, which we had a lot of fun recording. Unfortunately, there was some deep wrongness in the actual recordings of this episode, causing wrinkles to several of the original audio tracks, most of all mine. I've tried to get them into shape as well as I can, but I couldn't quite make it sound as good as our last few. My sincere apologies for the dip in quality. I only wish I knew what had caused it. I hope you enjoy, and we should be back on our usual gradual audio quality improvement by next episode. Hello, and welcome to Dice Punks, the tabletop role-playing podcast where we focus on playing full campaigns in less well-known systems. This week in episode 18, our only somewhat trepid heroes are faced with strange, unexpected, powerful visitors. Hello and welcome. I'm Adam, your friendly neighborhood game master, and joining me are... Hi, I'm Drew. I'll be playing Dosk Tier, Regal of Nothing, and guy who had a nice day and is probably about to have a worse one. I'm Robin, and I'll be playing Lissa Crate, the diplomatic and desirous Duchess of Fury. Hi, I'm Dez, and I will be playing Romnet, Prophet of the Obsidian God, uh, erstwhile philanderer, and current cuddle buddy no <laughs> <laughs> excellent thank you before we get started though uh we'll recap any stat growth for our characters the events of the previous episode uh and kind of make sure that all of our housekeeping is done first of all we have uh rum that's bonus yep, xp roll that is six dice which turns out to be a pair of fives and a pair of eights any set will do so that's that's an xp uh, it is. And are other folks spending XP today, or is that just me? I think I'm near the point of being able to spend, but I think I'm still not. Okay. Also, mm -hmm. Adam, remind me of the prices for both stats and skill upgrades. So, I am going to say what I remember, and I'll correct it in post if I need to. Increasing any stat is 10 XP, regardless of its current value or the value okay. you are promoting it to. Increasing any skill is the value of the rank you're promoting it to. So to go from 4 sure. to 5 is 5 XP. If you want to go from 3 to 5, it's 4 to go 1 rank, and then 5 to go the next okay. rank for a total of 9. Promoting to an expert yeah, die costs die 1 XP, five. and promoting to a master die okay. costs 5. Um... Okay, so I have six spells, or six XP worth of spells to buy, uh, since I'm not going to get Liquid Loquaciousness. So I'm getting Clearwater Oracle, which uh, is shenanigans. Uh, it is a divination <laughs> that has a chart involved and is not something you can ask a specific question about. Brightwater Oracle which is described in the book as this spell is more or less a clue dispenser. Uh, and unlikely avoidance, which is one of the flavors of get a master die for height and minutes spells. This one is for stealth. Uh, and then I think, since I have five further XP, uh, which is one shy, but that's fine. Uh, I am going to promote my one die in Counterspell to an Expert die as a telegraph and a reminder for next time to bump it up further. Most excellent. I believe we had indicated that that was all of our XP expenditure this time. No one else is yes, doing anything. Yes, I will continue yeah. to hoard mine like a dragon. <laughs> <laughs> I too am dragon-like for now. I can't wait to see what you guys do with How that. much XP are y'all uh, at? But <laughs> I... Too bad then. I'm, I mean, I'm at three immortal XP, so it's not, we're not, this is not a princely or, or dragon-esque pile. As Fair, yet. I do. 
I think Alyssa's got I, a I little do functionally more. Get I've got double five. Your guys's yeah. mortal XP because of that lore stunt. It accumulates Which quickly. Is yeah. yeah, delightful. And I've you know had so much opportunity to use all of my toys. <laughs> For those who may not remember, I mean, I spent some of it. You know, I, there was there was a there was a flash sale uh, to learn some Diamach, so I took advantage <laughs> of that. And then there was an in-character decision to to get real good. <clears throat> at sort of physical combat after after the disturbing experience on the ship which so far has not actually been useful at all which which I sort of love <laughs> uh, from a from a narrative perspective uh but yeah I have I have similarly weird plans for for these but not just yet I do look forward to it and yeah it accumulates more quickly when things go wrong than when things go right <laughs> sure so as for getting into the gameplay, I have to issue a brief correction to myself from last time. Uh, by the time I was getting to the end of session, uh, I was less alert than I should have been. I described the visiting nobilis as being uh, dark complected and dark of hair and eye. However, one of them, while dark complected, actually has light hair and light eyes. I'll get more into that in a moment, but I felt very stupid when I listened back to it because I had the descriptions written down and I just flubbed it. So apologies, we'll specify now. Hopefully it'll be relatively easy to keep straight because we haven't said more than 15 words about these people uh, up to this point, but wanted to go ahead and get that out of the way. So uh, if anybody is doing... Uh, continuity checking or cinema sins analysis uh, of this podcast uh that was an error and not a plot hole the earliest also, day God looking you. at you dad <laughs> yeah, <I'm> totally <laughs> <laughs> punk sins i don't even know do people do that for podcasts they must i'm sure it's a thing i hope not but gosh you never know so i believe that it is dosk's turn to summarize our previous session it is at that well Romnet, I now know, had moved his operations to the manifestation, and in the midst of his usual duties with the supplicants of Fermata, he heard that the statue had changed into a triumphal pillar, which, well, he knew what that probably meant. And indeed, among the crowd, he saw us returning and carrying Apatia amid the quietly celebrating throngs. We took Apatia to get some medical attention. She was covered in blood, of course, though not all of it was hers, of course. And we set up a sort of a, a sort of a, 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 a I'm, I'm struggling to come up with something that isn't a bit of an anachronism for us. But you, dear listener, we have a special relationship, you and I. So let's call it a baby monitor to know when she was ready for us to return. We ran into Kea and Moxie and Thad, two of whom now considered themselves lightward, the third not so much, being more or less made of light and all. Romnet was then summoned back to work by an acolyte, and at the entrance to the manifestation, he encountered an ungracious swarth who had a note from Romnet in Romnet's hand, scheduling an assignation of some kind, though Romnet had no recollection of writing it. And then, a stroke of genius. Lissa relieved Romnet of his duties for a while, allowing the two of us to have a moment's peace together, while she, I assume, had a very easy time with the supplicants. And, as she left, she encountered some strangers, two of whom she immediately knew to be nobles. Indeed, and that's pretty much where we're going to pick up. Uh, Lissa, you have just walked out of a harrowing couple of hours trying to deal with these supplicants. You feel like you did okay. Uh, but you all are also running on, like, the fumes of some shotgun coffee after the pretty tiring couple of weeks that you've had and no rest since you've been back. When exiting the manifestation, you find yourself face-to-face -face with an acolyte, a page, two people who have octoritases, and their dozen-and-a-half attendants. And to recap a little bit of the description from last time to set the scene, you are on the steps of the manifestation. They are near the bottom. The two presumably nobilis, because who else would have Octoritas, uh, are two steps up. All their attendants are still in the plaza in front of the manifestation. The attendants are dressed in these sort of, um, they're 
leather vests maybe that go down to about their waist the have sort of like a deep v in the front and back so they seem more decorative than anything as well as cloth like us earthlings might recognize them as kilts but it's not really a garment worn in Taraxis. um and the two nobilis uh are both wearing just the kilt part uh they are bare chested uh they are a man and a woman uh, the man is slightly larger, although uh, under six feet, uh, and uh, so you tower above them, especially from your vantage at the top of the steps. Uh, he is sort of like a deep, cold, deep golden complexion with very dark, glossy hair and sort of like loose waves down past his shoulders, very dark eyes, uh, and sort of like Features that Lissa, you sort of perceive as strong, right? Like everything about his face is like well defined, and he stands with uh, a confidence that bespeaks less of like his physical strength and more of his comfort. You know, he seems to sort of like lounge in a standing position, if that makes sense. Next to him, uh, the woman is uh, shorter still. She has much darker skin uh, and uh, quite light, kind of short hair it's this golden color uh her eyebrows as well uh her eyes are sort of a sky blue uh which you know her sort of, uh stands out a lot uh from the rest of her appearance their you know sort of uh coverings are uh they just kind of off white so they stand out quite a lot as well uh there are people of all you know, various kind of like shades that human beings come in in Taraxis and in Fermata. Uh, but uh, this particular combination of light hair and eyes and dark skin, the only person you've actually seen with that is Evine, uh, though you have not seen her lately. Um, they have greeted you with sort of formal, if slight, bows and gracious words, thanking you for your welcome into the city of darkness and the realm of the obsidian god and they seem to be waiting for a response <laughs> okay um <clears throat> this is one of those weird moments where i really should have thought through playing an incorrigible flirt <laughs> <laughs> before putting my souls in, <laughs> myself in situations where uh, <laughs> I just had a conversation with Kea not even la last session so not too many too long ago um, maybe three hours yeah in game time and I'm about ready to hit on some complete strangers again it makes me as a human uncomfy anyway I digress <laughs> um, well in Lissa's defense they are very comely and they are barely dressed yeah yeah yeah, you did this on purpose. <laughs> except um, in the plaza. Everything I do is on purpose. I was going to say, except in the plaza. <laughs> she's not made of stone. <laughs> Good point. And for the record, until I say otherwise, everything I do is on purpose. Eventually. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to give them a very warm smile. And perhaps my eyes are going to linger a little bit too constant on the blue eyes of the lady um just because you pointed out that it was something that we don't seldom see and i'll say i'm afraid that you've caught me at a bit of a disadvantage i i just returned so i didn't know to expect such lovely company but if you would be interested in a drink or perhaps some food i know of a place and then belatedly i remember that they bowed so i returned the bow <laughs> please roll me charm plus fascinate and this normally has a master die for no! you but <laughs> you are dead on your feet and you lose the master die from your pool monster <laughs> this is just continuing what was going on last time uh, i have two twos so i at least have i have a set um you do have a set you're paying, as you indicated, the most direct attention to the woman. Uh, she is uh, impassive while you are speaking, but when you are done and give them a little bow, you see her mouth cork and kind of a tiny little smile. And she says, 
We are unfamiliar with the customs of this land, but if drinks are a form of ceremonial greeting, and she loads that phrase with a little more skepticism than is necessary, uh, though the smile does not leave her, her face, then we would be happy to accompany you. May we bring, and she gestures, our entourage. Of course. Uh, all are welcome here. Um, if there is a particular welcoming ceremony that you're more comfortable with, I am all ears. Um, can I discreetly do a realm miracle? <laughs> um, I don't know how to potentially ping Dosk and Romnut <laughs> on my little... Like, I don't know if there's a way of pinging them, like a miraculous cell phone a beeper text perhaps <laughs> like anything to be like uh noblesse here help <laughs> <laughs> so you could do a ghost miracle that basically taps dosk on the shoulder uh dosk would be easier you could still do romnet uh but you can't really According to the rules, it would not be possible for you, not be impossible for you to send a verbal message, but you would have to speak it aloud here to do that. So yeah, I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to do a uh, ghost miracle, and instead of just tapping Dosk on the shoulder, I'm going to do the equivalent of urgently tugging his sleeve miraculously. <laughs> <laughs> just, just like ghostly, viciously poking him in the side. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> okay. So, to finish up with this scene first, uh, the man standing next to the woman uh, responds and says, We are happy to do here what your customs are, and perhaps we will entertain ours later, but thank you for making us welcome. And he inclines his head a little bit. Uh, again, seeming extremely at ease. At Chateau Romnet. Uh, Dosk, you have fallen asleep on Romnet's shoulder, um, you know, sort of mid cuddle. You have maybe been out for a few minutes, although it will be unclear to you when you awake. When there is a very odd disembodied sort of tugging sensation on your garments that causes you to. Uh, uh, realize that you were asleep, realize that you're waking up, realize that there is no one there tugging on that side of you. And almost before you can get a thought together, you also perceive, as does Lissa, that Apatia has awoken. Ah! <laughs> when it rains, it pours, and sometimes it pours blood. Okay. Um, <laughs> I don't say that out loud. I'm probably not nearly that coherent. I, I'm very but, glad because Romnet would um, be concerned. <laughs> <laughs> That's not the kind of thing you say to a Can't prophet lightly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I look to the side that has been tugged on and I see no one there. And uh, I I sort of blink the sleep out of my eyes. I assume I'm still extremely tired if, if after the day we've had, I've only slept a few minutes. Uh, so oh, yes. I attempt to get probably blearier now than you were. Yeah, no, it's worse. Yeah. Like there's, there is nothing worse <laughs> when you're really tired than like an, an, an aborted disco nap. <laughs> it's just, it's oh, the worst. <laughs> so yeah. So I, so I say to Romnit, uh, un unless you have some sort of invisible housemate you've not mentioned to me, in which case we should speak, I think perhaps we're needed. To the best of my knowledge, I have no housemates, visible, invisible, or otherwise. Where do we need to be going? Well, Apatia's awake, but I think there may be two distinct places we're needed, because if that didn't come from you or your invisible, visible otherwise, is there a third option? Anyway, I think that may must have come from Lissa who I think was more... Yeah, uh, the manifestation, in... yeah. Right. Which is, fortunately, <laughs> close by. You, um... Yes. I will, like, smooth your hair a bit, or otherwise <laughs> attempt to fix it. 
<laughs> I'm going to say the, <laughs> the, the part of the hair bit. where I was leaning on you. It's it's like the leaning tower of Pisa. That this was not a reference, of course we have, but it's you know it's 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 comp- it's in one direction and it's not an angle that necessarily seems natural. Uh, but I appreciate the smoothing and the touch in any case, and uh, I say we should probably get moving. I know that uh, equally meaningless to Taraxans is the reference to Sideshow Bob. But that's kind of how I picture your travel and sleep hair. Yeah, just, just, yeah that's, that's extremely good, yes. <laughs> so, the two of you, as quickly as Dosk can manage, head back for the manifestation. As Ramnut said, it is fortunately quite close. In the meantime, though... <laughs> Uh, we cut back to Lissa, uh, who, uh, you know, has, has been told that they will, you know, uh, happily go along with whatever your greeting ceremonies are, and then they can see about reciprocating sometime later, as they are in Rome and will do as the Romans do, to use, again, another meaningless phrase to Taraxans. Uh, so yeah, you, you are in a position to respond to this from your perch atop the manifestation steps. I realize that I've been quite rude and not properly introduced myself, so I, I give another bow and say, um, I am Lissa, Duchess of Furious Delight. <laughs> <laughs> I had to try really hard not to snort into the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> I saw the reactions and then just completely started laughing instead of <clears throat> finishing yeah. the statement. Um, Sorry, do carry on. <laughs> and may I have the pleasure of knowing your names and if it is appropriate, your entourage. Uh, a sort of bemused look passes uh, across the man's face, uh, and the woman gestures to herself in a way that draws attention to the fact, seemingly unintentionally, that she is not wearing a shirt. Uh, and uh, she says, I am Ia. Viscountess of the Sun, and gestures to her companion, who inclines his head and introduces himself. I am Rimush, Regal of the Moon. Ia takes, you know, the uh, thread of conversation back up and says, "Ah, oh, entourage are, well, they are here to help us while we stay and." I'm sure you will meet some of them, but 18 introductions would be cumbersome, so we may away now that the formalities are complete. And she gives you a a bigger, but sort of seemingly more sort of formal manufactured smile than her previous smirk. It's fitting that you are both in charge of celestial domains. They both look at you, kind of glance at each other, just kind of out of the corner of their eyes, uh, and uh, Rimush uh, says, You do seem delightful yourself. And uh, doesn't actually wink at you, but you still feel winked at. (laughs) My grin Uh, grows even larger. (laughs) (laughs) They each take one step kind of away from each other and sort of gesture, you know, down the steps. And uh, Ia says, Would I be correct in presuming that the drinks you mentioned are elsewhere? You would be. Uh, If you... Perhaps we can walk and talk at the same time. And I pointedly kind of move so, like, where they've parted, I'm standing shoulder to shoulder with them. Um, as opposed to. It is really pretty close to head to shoulder with them. Yeah. Um, you are much taller. <laughs> and they don't seem to have realized how tall you were until you're standing level with them. Uh, Rimush looks impressed. Ia looks. A combination of impressed and annoyed. Because, <laughs> uh, well, Rimush's head comes to about your shoulder just a little bit, maybe above it. If my math is right, which it may not be. Uh, but Ia's head is barely clearing your elbow. Oof. I offer them both 
my arms. <laughs> Almost in sync. They glance at your arms, glance at each other, glance up at you, and then glance back to your arms. Roll another fascinate for me, please. <laughs> Still no master dice. Still no master die. You will not get a master die until you have rested quite a bit. <laughs> ah, I got two tens! Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> what will Kay, I think? The nobilis yes. of the sun takes links her elbow through your uh, left elbow, and the nobilis of the moon lays his hand, cotillion style, on your upper arm, just above the elbow uh, of your right arm, as you turn away from the manifestation and into uh, the quiet city currently. At about that time, Dusk, Ramnet, you enter the plaza. So, Lissa, you see Dusk and Ramnet enter the plaza. Dusk, Ramnet, you enter the manifestation sort of uh, entrance plaza to see an oddly dressed entourage of 18 slightly diminutive, mostly dark complected, oddly dressed, uh, sort of, well, presumably servants, uh, and two completely shirtless, bekilted uh, nobilis. Uh, Dosk, you're aware that they're nobilis. As soon as you see them, you perceive their octoritas. Uh, the, uh, for the record, uh, the man, Rimush, uh, is uh, about as bright as Dosk, and the uh, woman, Ia, is about as bright as Lissa, uh, approximation-wise, anyway. Um, in terms of Arctortas. So, you see these two coming down the last couple of steps of the manifestation, literally arm-in-arm arm on either side of Lissa. <laughs> An acolyte and a page stand impassively and open-mouthed with perplexity, respectively, at the top of the manifestation steps. I convey some of the relevant information very quickly that that uh, that Romnet would not be able to intuit um, uh, in terms of the fact that these are, in fact, like Lissa and I, and you know, and, that, and the the relativeness of their of their power. And I also probably reiterate something he can plainly see, which is that Lissa has already made friends. Yeah, no. It <laughs> <laughs> uh, Rumnet's expression <laughs> clearly conveys the a, a statement of, well, look at you making friends. <laughs> it is it is at once an utterly confusing image and also something that seems like the most Lissa turn of events we could have walked into. Yeah. Lissa, you actually feel Ia and Rumush uh, sort of clock Dosk Sartoritas. Uh, as as he appears in the plaza, they don't go like rigid, but both of them sort of like give a slight response to seeing another mobilis. Ah, uh, ah, uh, yes, this is my beloved friend Dosk, <laughs> and uh, his partner Romnet. Um, I I will uh, let them introduce themselves once they get a little closer, and I would wave, <laughs> but you know I don't want to move my arms, <laughs> so I just kind of do like this head thing. <laughs> <laughs> Which is like a halfway with my head while smiling at them and say, we have delightful company. Okay, I was going to say, do I need to roll to, to, for whether I interpret the head waggle correctly? But the words <laughs> make it clear enough. So we we approach. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and All right. So, uh, yeah, as you get closer, without letting go of Lissa's arms, uh, both Ia and Rimush uh, sort of incline their heads very slightly in your direction, though not in Romnet's. Well, I uh, assuming this is cultural information, I incline my head equally slightly and say, uh, Das Pier, <laughs> regal of nothing, and a pleasure to make your acquaintance. This is Romnet. I'd s I um, say it grandly. And <laughs> are, are you attempting any particular social role here? Hmm. Or are you trying to, to have any particular effect? You don't have to. No, that's a good question. But as an option. Yeah, I think I think the goal here is to lay on the charm. So I think I will, in fact, roll charm. 
Okay. All right. Uh, is that going to be... I mean, Liss has been doing Fascinate because she's flirting. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Are you going to do graces let's call it graces yeah because the the goal okay. the goal here is to smooth over whatever weird uh whatever weird <laughs> disinterest they have uh in romnet and also to hopefully ingratiate myself uh to uh to these these uh fine folks whoever they are uh it's <laughs> better better to be on their good side than to not be on their good side so that would be um, sure sure that's gonna be five dice it will in fact be four oh, because kinda, you have a penalty die from your fatigue i count all yeah. that fair enough I actually have been, I need to come clean, I've been using penalty die a little more broadly than Rain uses it. If you have looked at the Rain rules on our recommendation, you will have seen that there are penalty dice, and then there is uh, a um, like die modifier called a difficulty die. This is actually a difficulty die, uh, which removes something from your pool rather than making you take the lower roll. So apologies for the lack of clarity. Just wanted to cover my... Uh, imprecision there. To you may go ahead and roll sins. four dice yeah you narrowly dodged another ding over at actual play sins or wherever okay <laughs> here we go <laughs> my gm sins are many <laughs> so that it is a, a pair of ones pair of seven but it's but ah, it's a pair it God is a pair damn of sevens it. <laughs> oh that's right though because and you are striking sad boy yes, and i got him to say it again it's a good day <laughs> <laughs> it's a good day Punch one more out on your card. <laughs> what happens when his card fills? We dread to learn. <laughs> Great and terrible things. <laughs> so, uh, that is established. Uh, unless there are immediate consequences to it, it seems I like this say... is rum that sounds like I should introduce myself. You probably should. For the record, the response that Lissa perceives from Ia and Rumush uh, is uh, Ia's uh, arm and yours kind of tightens and then loosens, and Rumush's hand on your elbow uh, sort of does like a little like kind of sequential finger tap, uh, and both seem to be giving polite smiles in Dosk's direction. Romnet, go ahead and introduce yourself. I'm Romnet. Uh, the prophet, I suppose, of the Obsidian God. Uh, and at this point, I will also roll Charm plus Graces, which is actually, for me, Charm plus Fascinate. Uh, mm. Because special, I'm special and there are mechanics. Uh, yes. Uh, and you actually get your master yeah! head because you're not criminally sleep-deprived. Anyway, right, there are so. benefits to sleep. And also must be nice. Must be nice. Yeah, part of Dosk's problem is the caffeine because he's crashing from Mm. his coffee a couple hours ago. Well, that was a pair of tens on two dice, so that is three tens. Hmm. And I am blithely ignoring the obvious uh, disdain for our relative uh, degrees of supernatural shenanigans. And I can get away with that because, uh, what is the specific wording? Uh, it won't make me seem polite, but instead I'm stylishly doing my own version of politeness. Hmm. That, that being romantic outlaw charm, which allows me to use fascinate instead of graces. Indeed. So you actually, um... You feel, as you lay on the charm graces, uh, you you sort of feel their attention shift in its quality on you, uh, and you see uh, the man on Lissa's arm uh, sort of uh, lid his eyes slightly and kind of give you a closer look, while the woman on Lissa's other arm uh, kind of smiles a little bit more genuinely at you. And says, Prophet, that sounds pretty important. Now, Romnet, you are the one who is probably most likely to pick up on this, but I'm going to make you roll anyway. I mean, sure. Likely doesn't mean guarantee. What am I rolling? Sense plus hearing. Okay. 
five dice. Uh, that is a pair of nines. A pair of nines. You notice that they don't speak with an accent. You're not sure where they're from, but like clearly they're not from Taraxis. Yet you understand them perfectly, and it's like getting a call from an Omaha call center. Like there's no accent. You know, it's uh, surprisingly bland. I probably chime in at this point uh, and introduce my new friends. <laughs> I uh, kind of j- incline my head uh, towards the woman first and say, this is Ia, Viscountess of the Sun, and Rimush, the Regal of the Moon. Celestial indeed. <laughs> uh, Rimush actually chuckles, uh, whereas uh, Ia merely smiles and sort of uh, uses her uh, hand on the arm that's uh, hooked through your elbow to sort of like stroke her fingertips across your forearm. Uh, and they both incline their heads slightly uh, and say, uh, or Ia rather, says, Thank you for your hospitality here in this city of darkness. The Obsidian God is a gracious host, as are the three of you. Remush picks up and says, I'm told we're headed for some drinks, as seems to be the custom for greetings around here. Indeed. I should have panic looked at Romnut. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, will, I will just unflappably cover that the, the, the provision of food and drink is a core part of the hospitality of Fermata, it's true. Is there any, are there, are there any preferences or aversions that we should be aware of? Remish says, I think I'm more interested to see what the customs here are like. And Ia says, and for my part, I always like to try new things. So your choice. All right. So. If on the assumption that both of our nobles are possibly looking to me for knowledge of uh, where we should be taking these folks, <laughs> uh, I will guide us to, sorry Adam, I'm going to be mean, a bar that we have not been to before. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Thank you. Specif- specifically, uh, one that <laughs> sort of straddles the line, as it were, between what is acceptable in the quiet city and what is acceptable in the riotous city and possibly has a pass-through, uh, and is mm. going to be uh, a place where the cuisine and alcoholic traditions of the city this used to be are carried on. Interesting. Das gives Romnit a, uh, a, an appreciative and encouraging squeeze, and uh, and meanwhile, on another plane of existence, Drew uh, raises his fist in encouragement to Des. <laughs> okay, so... <clears throat> Ramnet, you come to this decision in a moment's thought and sort of beckon for everyone to follow as you turn around. Dosk, you turn around next to Ramnet to sort of trail slightly behind him as he leads the way, and your eyes widen as a flying apatia careens into you, knocking you to the ground in a very enthusiastic hug. At that, I'm gonna say I made the ill-advised choice. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna say I made the ill-advised choice to try and greet her, thinking somehow that she would stop 
a moment before colliding with me. So the result is probably my saying something along the lines of, Hello! (laughs) Thud. You hit the ground with an oof that drives not all of the air, but some of the air out of your lungs. And Apatia squeezing you, not to rib-cracking intensity, but to, I'm too injured for this intensity. (laughs) Uh, As uh, she sort of sits up and looks around, uh, Ia and Rimush are looking at her with some perplexity. And uh, Apatia stands and looks like she's going to hug Lissa until she sees Ia and Rimush on your arms, uh, at which point she uh, gives you a like full sharp-toothed grin <laughs> uh, and addressing apparently the both of you uh, says, Oh, this place is lovely. Where are we? Well, this is Fermata. <clears throat> and <laughs> it is very good to see you up and about and lively. Perhaps we should uh, stand. <clears throat> that she is an in character nods and. Now, all of that was in character. Was the was the idea? <laughs> mm-hmm. Oh, was that sorry? If I was speaking. I was speaking for myself. Oh, good, good, good. Ah, I see. Um, yeah, she helps you up uh, and turns to Lissa and says, your new friends seem fascinating. Uh, seemingly leaving it at that. <laughs> I I repeat the introductions I gave earlier and then return a patient's very toothy fanged grin with one of my own and say that... <laughs> Uh, my delight upon seeing you alert and happy and well is fitting of uh, your domain of sensation. <laughs> uh, she gives you another, uh, you know, sort of flash of smile and does uh, the sort of customary bow that you were used to seeing from people in Diamakor, uh toward Ia and Rimush uh, and says... It is good to make your acquaintance. I seem to be meeting all of my peers all at once. Uh, and, you know, seems a little bit giddy, uh, especially for Apatia. Um, Dosk, having helped you up with one hand, she has not let go of your hand. I realize at this point that she hasn't actually met Romnet, so I make that introduction. Uh, but I try to be a little sly about not uh, putting Romnet on the back foot as though... As though he's not met her yet. So I, uh, I simply say, Romnet was about to show us around and uh, give our visitors a, a good time. And I, whatever arm is not currently engaged with Apatia goes to Romnet to, to make hopefully whatever point needs to be made. Uh, I don't know if the previous Grace's role counts or if I should roll it again since this is a weird situation. But uh, a novel one. I mean, I want you to roll it again you, because I'm evil. Because so. you are diabolical. So that is uh, one yeah, die less four again. Dice. Four dice. Yeah. yeah. Okay. That is oh, funny enough. Oh, actually, funny enough, it's a pair of sevens, which translates to a pair of sevens. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right on the money. Um, <laughs> you managed to play this off relatively smoothly, as you sort of. Uh, offer one hand to Ramnet. Are you like going to hold his hand or like put an arm around his shoulder or around his waist or like where I think my hand is reaching for his hand. Yourself? I think that's yeah, the, the okay. least ambiguous thing I can manage uh, at the moment. I yeah. will take his hand uh, and relatively and... obviously like stroke my thumb over his fingers. <laughs> uh, Apatia grins, still not really pushing your hand. Uh, and says, I was hoping you would show me around, so let's be off. Uh, and she turns somewhat guilelessly, and again with sort of a manic energy, to Ia and Rumush, uh, and says, My Imperator's name is Nyx. What is yours? They look a little taken aback, but... Ia speaks a a little more quickly than Rumush does and says, Our Imperator, our God, 
is named Sirtha. And Apatia just kind of smiles and nods, and she says, It is wonderful to make your and your god's acquaintance. Uh, presumably by this point, Romnet is leading the oh, way, yeah. and now sort of leading a daisy chain yep, pretty much. Uh, of Dosk and Apatia uh, with this sort of uh, demigod-flanked Lyssa behind. You lead everybody through the quiet city. Um, what are the chances that you're doing like a little bit of a tour guide thing while you go? Hi for Lissa, though she is very uneducated in the layout. So she points out things that okay. are only of interest to her. Like, there's a window that I especially like, the design of. <laughs> oh, yeah, if you if you go over two blocks that way, you'll see the forge where I sometimes work. I I'm absolutely probably, uh, playing tour guide as well. I'm throwing in the, they're all, they're all on the order of Dosk Fox. There's the, the truth value yeah. is highly questionable. The entertainment value, however, <laughs> is impeccable. Uh, probably I mentioned that, you know, I'm sure Rom that is taking us somewhere extremely appropriate. It's a shame that the mirror skiff still isn't open because, and I, uh, I describe, uh, I describe mm. all that used to go on there. <sighs> Yeah, I imagine between these two, Ramnet, you can get words in edgewise if you'd like, but uh, it may not be easy. Um, Where and, does uh, Fox have a basis in truth? I will supply some of that. <laughs> so long as it does not... Lovely. Diplomatically inter- said. <laughs> so long as it does not contradict what he is saying and does not diminish the entertainment value of it. <laughs> <laughs> so in this manner you proceed through quite a bit of the quiet city Ia and Rimush are particularly interested in the people walking into and out of the canals which necessitates an explanation of the riotous and quiet cities which I deliver um, in a tone of ooh. oh yeah that right uh, Dusk for your part Apatia is basically vibrating <laughs> with excitement on that uh, explanation. She seems to think that is, to coin a phrase, wicked cool. Uh, but after a brief interval, 15, 20 minutes, you arrive at the establishment that Romnet had decided to aim for, uh, a sort of restaurant by day tavern by night uh that is called the obsidian falcon (laughs) i love it i used to dance under that name (laughs) how dare you uh (laughs) the great i laughed i can't can't there ever was Uh, the building itself, uh, being a little bit further out from sort of the center of the city, uh, is fairly large. It's freestanding. I like everything else in Fermata. It is made of a combination of a sort of obsidian carved foundation and wood and stone. Uh, light comes very in very limited quantities out through the windows and uh, everything else is limbed in that sort of silver half light. Uh, that characterizes Fermata. The sign uh, depicts an obsidian falcon mid-dive with its stony nature sort of described by the rough sort of hued quality of its outline. Uh, And the noise coming from inside is muted but audible as you approach. Uh, It seems to have two full stories and a third sort of attic story, all of which seem to be in use from that you know that the first floor is sort of a common room. The second floor is where like parties are seated for meals, and the third floor is where the rooms for both uh, Let and for the proprietors are located. So, uh, <laughs> in order to get through the door of the Obsidian Falcon... <laughs> The various hand-holding and arm-linking finally has to come to an end. And at some point during all of this, the uh, 18-person entourage just kind of evaporated. They seem to have peeled off into the city at various points. I, need to ask I, I might have flagged so... down an acolyte or three to suggest <laughs> <Okay>. lodgings. <laughs> Got it. 
Okay. Good to know. It seemed possible you meant they literally evaporated for a brief moment, so I just needed to... Like, are they vapory? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're, you're absolutely order. right in retrospect. <laughs> that was figurative, okay. but I'm glad you brought it up. Walking in, this is the cleanest, most nicely appointed common room you've yet been in. I should say that Dosk and Lissa have yet been in in Fermata. Uh, there are... You know, sizable hardwood tables with carved chairs. The bar itself is, you know, quite grand, has some gilding on it. It's the equivalent of going to the expensive restaurant in town. Uh, and you are greeted near the door by a man who is tall, but not as tall as Lissa, uh, and dressed in the height of Vermont in fashion, which is to say, matte black clothing with silver highlights of accessories. Uh, and he gives you a officious bow, uh, especially upon seeing Romnet, uh, and says, Prophet, my lord and lady, esteemed guests. His eyes flicker over the exposed chests of uh, Rimush and Ia, and he doesn't quite purse his mouth, but it twitches as though he wants to. Uh, he says, Should I prepare a private dining room? That would be lovely, thank you. He bows again and says, Of course, Lord Prophet, right this way. Uh, and he stops briefly to exchange words with the barkeep and then leads you up the stairs in the back towards the second floor. In short order, you are shown into a room that seems more uh, appropriate to a banquet than to six people uh, eating, but he seats you all at one end of the table near the door uh, with no one at the head and uh, indicates that he will be back shortly. The door closes behind him, and you are seated at the table. Um, the order that the seating order that your <laughs> server has indicated is optional. You certainly can break it, but he directed Lissa to a seat between Ia and uh, Rimush, and then uh, Dask to a seat on the opposite side of the table between Apatia and Romnet. Seems about right. Yeah, I'll I'll go for that. But you know, since we've all let go of each other's hands and arms and limbs and what have you, um, I when I the first opportunity I get, I give a Pesha a warm hug and probably spin her a little. Mm, uh, she hugs you back and uh, giggles somewhat. It is notable how giddy she seems to be. You are seated. Uh, I think this puts uh, Ramnet across from Rimush and Apatia across from Ia, with Dosk across from Lissa, should the seating matter. Uh, by the time that your uh, server comes back, uh, and he's this is, of course, not like a modern American restaurant. Uh, he lists the things they have prepared this evening in terms of food and um, Ia and Rimush both just say that they would like whatever he recommends, as they seem kind of unfamiliar with the dishes, which tend toward uh, meat stewed with fruit and vegetables, uh, and then flavored with herbs and spices. Uh, this could be uh, poultry, red meat, or fish, although you're not sure where any of it comes from, now that you think about it. Uh, and uh, as far as beverages go, the sky is the limit. Of course, Ia and Rimush do not really have any frame of reference for Taraxin beverages. And uh, so they are going to, and they announce their intention, uh, to copy what Lissa <laughs> <laughs> um, I should take this opportunity to point out to you, it probably escaped notice for the first little bit, but they have not reacted in any particular way to Romnet's smoking void skull. Yeah. 
And it suits him. I mean. It does. He carries off the look. That's what it comes down to. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, no. Uh, <laughs> we're going to get these people drunk. <laughs> <laughs> um, I imagine that they don't have moonshine at an establishment like this or something of that. So th- at least we're safe would be by correct. that. Um, what else? <laughs> I think in this case, Lissa may be cognizant enough of it being a diplomatic experience <laughs> that I'm just going to order the nicest wine that I can pick off of the menu. Okay. So, you're not actually, of course, handed like a physical menu here. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, again, being sort of a... Um, uh, for modern version of a restaurant rather than a modern American version of a restaurant, but you sort of cast about a little bit and murmur to your server a little bit, and he recommends what he calls the blackberry brandy wine. Uh, and so uh, you order that for you, Ia, and Rimush. Uh, out of curiosity, uh, what, if anything, in terms of beverages, do Dusk and Romnet order? I think both out of an experience with this particular establishment and as a, uh, a hopeful further gambit to get uh, get our esteemed guests to respect Romnet, I defer to Romnet on this point. Uh, I'll order something tasty and... Only moderately alcoholic, uh, out of probably both personal preference and an awareness of how tired Dusk is. Yeah, you you pick a fine vintage of red wine that you happen to know this place carries. Uh, that is just normal ass wine. Yeah, uh, but quite good in your experience. And, uh, so your orders are put in when Apatia speaks up and, uh, asks your server, (laughs) what varieties of blood do you have? Oh, God, I knew that was coming. damn it, Adam. Blinks once, looking at her and says, well, milady, I am not sure I understand. We don't keep bottled blood on hand. Apatia, in turn, blinks once and says, you don't? Oh. And looks around the table in a sort of a brief panic and goes, no, of course not. Um, <laughs> she points at Dosk and says, I'll have what he's having. <laughs> the server nods once slowly and then wordlessly leaves <laughs> the room. <laughs> Good choice. Uh, Ia and Rimush kind of glance at each other across uh, Lissa, which takes some doing. Uh, they have to lean forward a fair bit to accomplish it. Uh, and uh, then Rimush says, this is fascinating. Much more private than catered dining back home. I shall have to make a note of it. It's Feels very important, and he smiles. Where is home for you? Remush opens his mouth, and Ia cuts in and says, To the north, it is beyond the forest. Well, I was going to say north of here, but north of your region, anyway. How far exactly, I couldn't say. We came here the customary way. We found some darkness and concentrated. But, um, many, many miles. Much warmer. Much warmer than this area. It's called Sirtha. The area, as well as the god. She nods. She says, oh yes. It is somewhat odd to encounter a region that does not call itself after its god, but to each of their own, I suppose. 
I sort of whisper to Romnet, to your knowledge, is that normal for a god and a place to share a name? Romnet, to your knowledge, who knows? I mean, I, I, I will respond by <laughs> mentioning that from what you have encountered, there are several active imperators in the greater area, and further, it is unclear whether I will nod at Apatia. Nix's geography matches her title. Apatia, for her part, kind of goes, Oh no. Nix resides in Kilata, the capital of Diamakor. Or at least, it will be. And she looks a little distant for a moment and says, One day, at least. And yet, Rimush says, and yet Nyx is the only imperator, the only goddess there. So curious. The patient nods, and Rimush says, "Sutha is certainly the only god in our region as well. Is the Obsidian God alone here in?" And for the first time, you hear him sort of struggle. Uh, with a Taraxan word, as he says, Taraxis? In Taraxis, no. In Fermata, certainly. He nods slowly, seeming to digest this information, and Apatia says, well, It's quite easy to understand, really. I mean, Nyx has always been, but the Diamakor always revered their ancestors first. It's only since I've been born and able to bring the word of Nyx to the Diamakor people that the Vale has really begun to revere Nyx first and foremost, as they, of course, always should have. She glances around as though she's afraid of being overheard uh, and says, but certainly not everyone outside the Vale yet recognizes Nyx's authority as, well, as the two of you found out, and she seems downcast for about two seconds before she sort of bobs back up, buoyed by her sort of wave of manic energy and says, this is exciting though, I never thought I would be able to see anything beyond the shores of the Vale. Yes, it seems we have a great deal to discuss, shall I say professionally, as well as personally. This is a most happy, and I must say, most unexpected meeting <laughs> have we gotten our drinks yet <laughs> yeah i'll say it while he is saying that the drinks come in uh so i naturally propose a toast to uh new friends and dear friends <laughs> um so this is a silly question that i nevertheless have to ask when you are proposing a toast. Do you say a toast? Do you use that word or do you just say to new friends and dear friends or whichever way you I, I wouldn't I <laughs> as much as <laughs> diplomacy and is interesting to navigate, I would just hoist my glass in the air and say <laughs> to new friends and old friends. Uh or new yeah, friends and dear friends, look, sorry. <laughs> new friends and dear friends. You're you're good. Yeah, uh, Ia and Rimush both kind of look at each other across you again and then mimic you with the glass but don't say anything. Uh, whereas, uh, um, I will offer Apatia. Oh. Uh, I will offer an explanatory aside that it's a, a <laughs> an aspirational invocation, a toast. <laughs> they seem, uh, grateful for the explanation if. Uh, non-verbally. Meanwhile, Apatia raises her glass and uh, says, and to wonderful libations with friends, uh, giving her big smile all around the table, which affords uh, Ia and Rimush a chance to see her extremely sharp teeth. Um, As though to take the edge off I that, note. literally and figuratively, I do say... <laughs> 
to new friends and dear friends and wonderful libations, raising my glass and inclining my head almost imperceptibly, having absorbed the idea that it, a very slight incline of the head is culturally important to these two. <laughs> As a point for our listeners at home, especially who may be wondering, Apatia is not currently clad in her blood drenched travel clothes. <laughs> Um, apparently the medics did manage to get her into some pretty just kind of like run of the mill to uh sorry for Martin specifically uh garb which is similar to Taraxan garb but dark uh for the benefit of our listeners Alyssa is still very much dressed like a pirate but now with the addition of whatever robe wool robe that the acolytes draped around <laughs> her shoulders of course the robe didn't come off this rules yes yeah of course uh Dosk and Alyssa also still bearing bandages uh from their their treatment earlier in the day uh so you know just to complete the mental picture there so uh, after the toast, the food arrives, uh, because this is, of course, not a modern restaurant. All the food is sort of prepared ahead of time. Drinks are brought first, and then food so that it is warm by the time you have warmed up, so to speak. But uh, there is a very small uh, lag in time there. So food arrives, and uh, Ia and Rimush take cues from watching uh you know the Taraxans eat uh, and you know sort of how to use the utensils properly and whatnot uh and make thoughtful mm, noises as they eat uh they'll offer no commentary um Apatia, for her part has uh ordered the sort of stewed red meat uh let's say that it was venison uh and uh <laughs> expresses softly to Dusk in particular, although it is audible over the chewing to everyone at the table if you choose to pay attention to it, uh, that I was hoping it would be a little fresher. I had a feeling you would be uh, slightly dissatisfied with the, uh, well, the freshness. <laughs> she shrugs a shoulder and, you know, sort of says, well, I don't want to be rude, and begins to just shovel big sort of forkfuls into her mouth one after the other, seeming to swallow without chewing. I love her so much. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I imagine as everyone is eating, I try to strike up some light conversation, and I ask what Sirtha is like. Uh, <laughs> both the god and the place, I say after a beat. <laughs> I gesture as though this was a very well, uh, clever pun in some way. <laughs> uh, Ia, again, exchanges a glance across Lissa. They're getting better at it uh, with Rimush and uh, then sort of takes the lead and, sa and says, The country of Sirtha is, well, warm compared to what we, what little we have seen of Taraxis. But, um, brighter as well. As you get further north, you may know the weather gets warmer and the rainfall more plentiful. Our country is far enough north that it almost never gets as cool as it is here. Uh, but the people are mostly hardworking and devoted, she says very seriously. And Sirtha has been worshipped there for many centuries, but has recently returned in much more vigor than before to elect Rimush and I, his chosen representatives. Of course, the sun and moon are not his only responsibilities, but they are his most symbolic. And he wishes, at this point, to branch out, connect with the rest of the world in a way that he has been unable to during his long slumber. And so we are here to establish formal diplomatic ties to the followers of the Obsidian God, whom Sirtha remembers dimly from the distant past, and to see if we can't form stronger ties to the commerce of Taraxis as well. Our cities are not so great as this, though our population is 
very large. They are diffuse. Most of them like it that way. And we would certainly not choose to change it, but it limits some of the things we can produce on our own, which is why Taraxan traders have always been welcome when they have arrived that far north. I'm given to understand that they mostly stop at ports further south, but this is hearsay. She shrugs one shoulder and says, I'm not sure if that was what you were looking for, but it's what I can offer on short notice, and gives you a polite smile. Oh, that was wonderful, Ia, and I, I think you and Dosk may have much to speak of commerce. Uh, and I can appreciate Sirtha's desire to branch out. Uh, <laughs> I, I think that is important that we work together, and I can't help but think that all of our domains are of relation to each other. Darkness, sun, moon, sensation, nothing. I trail off. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't agree more, and I I must make it clear that I am not of, I mean, that is to say, I'm, <clears throat> it's not about commerce in, in a divine capacity. That's a purely mortal pursuit of mine, but a lifelong one. Uh, you see, when I'm not here, it's not an interest of Mott's so much as of the, the Tyr family, but commerce. That's certainly an interesting reason to make the acquaintance of a god. Rimush looks a little confused and says, If you wish to trade with someone, is it not customary to get the approval of their master first? In my experience, people aren't quite prepared to go that far up the chain. I also, he shrugs one shoulder. I also think you'll find us a lot more chatty uh, than our, our most wonderful imperator and i kind of take a wry sip of my wine i say well said and down whatever's currently <laughs> in my glass Rimush takes a sip of his wine looks thoughtful uh looks thoughtfully at the glass specifically and this is a establishment that uses glass uh for its beverages uh and then turns to romnet and says i hope it's not rude to ask but you're aspect differs from most others. Is this a popular cosmetic choice in Fermata? Uh, it is, so far as I'm aware, unique to me. It is the result of gifts of magic that I have been given. He looks, you know, sort of politely impressed uh, and says, Indeed, well, he gives you a sly smile and says, it suits you. Uh, I say then, only uh, with my eyes, doesn't it, though? <laughs> I, I am going to roll a charm plus fascinate to simultaneously, like... <laughs> seem like I am flirting with Rimush and, like, be, like, with more, more with body language than with eye contact reassuring of Dusk. Go ahead and roll. Uh, so that is uh, a pair of fours that becomes three fours that becomes three sevens. Indeed. Uh, Rimush's glance kind of, you know, bounces at a leisurely pace between uh, Romnet and Dosk. And he sort of retains a small but seemingly fairly warm smile as it does. At which point, Ia sort of meeting Lissa's glance or catching Lissa's gaze as you sort of put your drink down and says on the subject of questions I hope are not rude you are of impressive stature is that common among Taraxans or unique to you I can't say that it's common uh, I like to think of it as uh, one of my many good traits 
she gives a small but seemingly very genuine smile and says, Wow, it certainly is striking. Uh, you know, in sort of a lower, uh, you know, sort of voice that, that seems meant, uh, you know, to... Uh, I mean, it's audible, but it seems meant to, to be for Lissa. Apatia, for her part, uh, sort of grins broadly and says, I know, is Lissa just so impressive? And then immediately leans her head on Dosk's shoulder. Ah! <laughs> I do my best not to react to this for the moment and say, I too have a question <laughs> that I hope is not rude. I notice we've not yet discussed what precisely Sirtha is the god of. Uh, they both blink in a little bit of surprise and then almost in unison chuckle and shake their heads. And Remush says, how oh, silly of us, of course. Uh, and Ia picks up and says, simply put, he's the god of the cosmos. Nailed it. <laughs> I don't actually say that in character. No. But sure, yeah, I figured. You do with your body, <laughs> but not with your voice. Yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I uh, probably look very smug with myself for half a second. <laughs> Remush nods and says, Indeed, we are his primary ambassadors to the mortals as the moon and sun. He gestures with his head to himself and to Ia, and she picks up and says, But he has dominion over all things cosmic she says with perfect confidence well it's not at all difficult to see how a god of the cosmos and a god of darkness would be natural allies the cosmos containing a good deal of well <laughs> and vice versa i suppose um they kind of smile and nod politely. Um, Dosk, seated across uh, from Lissa, may not catch it, but Romnet, seated across from Rimush, probably does. Uh, the smile seems a little brittle to you. Uh, on Rimush, at least. Um, if I don't notice, then I won't react. But, hmm. That is your curse. Uh <laughs> Usually Das yeah, curse is reacting, that's... but okay, sure. <laughs> that is your Druze. Yeah, curse. okay, fair draw, fair draw. I'll be over here. Uh, Ia picks up her wine glass and sort of looks at it and she says, May I ask what this is made of? It is quite a compelling beverage. If no one else speaks to that, I will explain the notion of wine. Uh, you give a brief but fairly clear explanation. He uh, sort of nods and says, I see. Yes, mostly in Sirtha we distill grains, but... I lean forward. I there's, no <laughs> 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 there's no reason you couldn't do it with fruits as well, I suppose. We just tend to eat those as are, uh, though they are plentiful. Um... Should you ever come to visit? And her gaze rests on Lissa as she says that. I would rather like to visit sometime. It sounds lovely. And I do enjoy fruits and other things that are sweet on the tongue. <laughs> Ia looks like she is about to respond when... Uh, Apatia, having finished her glass of wine, uh, speaks up and uh, says... <laughs> he's, la he's laughing before he gets it out. <laughs> she says, This wine is almost as good as blood. Speaking of which... And she looks around the table <laughs> after trailing off. <laughs> <laughs> her gaze where if nobody volunteers lands on dusk uh My i seeing that i i quickly cut in with ask me nicely later uh a page's head swivels around to listen and says 
I only ask nicely. Of course you do. <laughs> yeah, and Rimush are somewhat bemused by this exchange. <laughs> um, <laughs> Apesha, you haven't really seen her red in the face before, but it appears that she is not used to alcohol as uh, she is flushing noticeably at this point, uh, having finished her meal before anyone else uh, and her glass as quickly as anyone else. Uh, and after the couple of beats of silence, uh, Rimush, he doesn't really clear his throat, but he gives a really throat-clearing kind of vibe <laughs> before he uh, speaks up and says, You should probably know that Sirtha's control over the land of Sirtha is fairly absolute, but we haven't seen much outside of Vermata here. Reports from merchants say that Taraxis is, well, and Ia helpfully chimes in and says, somewhat dissolute. Uh, Rimush sort of, you know, makes a non-committal gesture to the word, and then continues and says, I suppose what we would want to know is, if we make an agreement with the Obsidian God, or with Fermata, and he nods toward Romat, how far does that carry? It's a very fair question. I dare say the influence of darkness is indeed a bit more subtle, a bit more intermingled with other forces. I, I think it's fair to say, I turned to Lissa briefly, even our own instructions can sometimes be a bit obscure. So I suppose what I'm saying is I would not expect anything absolute. Darkness is so rarely absolute. However, I will pick up as if this is a smooth and practiced transition. It may depend also on the nature of the terms and the covered trade. Additionally, diplomatic relations will vary somewhat as Taraxis has several separable institutional governments, but Fermata is a place all unto itself. They look thoughtful, and Ia says, That is good to know. Is... Are rumors of a place called the God's Woods exaggerated? We have heard of wondrous things your merchants have brought from there. Do I need to roll lore to know what the hell you're talking about with the godswoods? You know of it. You, If you want to know anything specific about it, you can roll lore, but it is a honestly relatively small, by Taraxan standards, forest uh, that sort of uh, occupies the lateral coastline between the Vales and the southern trading cities, uh, a little inland, and uh, the main claim to fame is, is that there are seemingly authorless artifacts found there with some regularity that have unusual or even detectably magical properties to them that seem arbitrary. I think Lissa would they actually... Are one of remember this based on the nature of the artifacts during our trip so i would probably chime in oh, say, um they're absolutely true uh i even dare say miraculous in nature uh Ia and rimush both kind of you know nod and absorb this information and then after another pause and another exchange glance Ia says, with a sort of purposeful casualness, I suppose that the other question to 
bring up now is an odd one, but Sertha has tasked us with seeking a specific piece of knowledge here, but we don't have very much information about it. Remish nods and says, We were supposed to find something here called the Currents of the Cosmos, but we're not sure what it is. Now, Dusk, I will let you decide how you react to this, but that phrase is familiar to you. In fact, it is part of the title of the book that you were looking for in Selvin when you ended up in Fermata. The full title of that book being Sojourns in Light and Dark, The Currents of the Cosmos Revealed to the Minds of Mortals. I think... I don't feign ignorance, but I do play it cool. Or I attempt to, and in fact, that's probably a role now that I say Doskin playing it cool in the same sentence. Uh, <laughs> since it doesn't come naturally. Um, yeah, I think I, I, I let on that uh, that I know something of what they're speaking of, but that I, I would like to know more of what they know about it. Uh, perhaps also throwing in that vague instructions from the powers that be mean that we may have more in common than we initially thought. All right, so do you think this is a graces? Yeah, or, or you know what? Let's call it a jest. Let's see if I can I can make them shortle in the process of conveying okay. this information. That's going to be four dice, remember, because you currently are operating under the difficulty of being extremely out of How course. could I forget? <laughs> that is... Oh, wow. I've, <laughs> I rolled two sixes and two sevens. Uh, only the two sevens matter, and they stay two sevens. Indeed they do. Uh, so, yeah, you, you sort of you know, make this joke about unclear instructions and, and are vague about your knowledge of it, uh, of, of what they're talking about. Um, and you do get a laugh, but immediately when it subsides, Rimush sort of leans forward and says, So you know something of these currents of the cosmos, then? I think... Um... So I was I was seeking this book when I ended up in Fermata. Should I roll lore to say how much I can recall about what I already knew about the currents of the cosmos? I assume this was not my my very first foray into the topic. As I remember, your uh, motivation for seeking it was somebody arguing to you in a pub somewhere that you couldn't really understand the nature of the world until you read this particular book, which is housed in one place, this library in Selden. So you can roll lore, but it seems that your prior knowledge is probably limited. What you maybe researched between that conversation and your trip to Selden maybe could provide you with something. So that's going to be, uh, in this case, six steps, All right. because you're still suffering more. Because, because of, you know, gestures and everything. Okay. But I mean, you're still bandaged and stitched. So. <laughs> it's been a day, okay? Uh, that is two eights. All right. So, <clears throat> it is apparently famously anonymous, and there is some debate over whether it is an original work in Taraxin or whether it is a translation of... Uh, volume from somewhere else. There's even an argument that it is based on a volume in another language, but greatly expanded by its Taraxin translator. Um, there seems to be only this one copy of it, and frankly, the knowledge about the book is pretty limited, but the people who know anything about it at least know a fair bit of its history. Only probably half a dozen people alive in Taraxis now have ever read it due to its scarcity, uh, and now that you are finally able to revisit the idea, you are really not sure why you didn't find it in the library in Selden, except for possible interference from Mott, although that's hard to verify one way or the other. I don't share that. <laughs> I say that... Sure. I know precious little on the topic, but I've encountered others who seem to think it's very important indeed, and I may know where to learn more, although it may not be easy to obtain the information. And hopefully that was 
suitably non-evasive and yet evasive. A little, just mysterious enough. Both of your guests look thoughtful, and in the brief silence that follows, uh, Apatia, from where she has leaned her head on your shoulder, snores softly. <laughs> you made me snort into the microphone. Let the record show. Um, <laughs> I, I do not disturb her. Um, and I ask our guests, do you know why? This is important to you and to your God specifically. He yeah, shrugs and says, we assume it is because of the subject matter. We didn't even know until you mentioned it just now that it would be a volume uh, rather than, well, any other form of knowledge or artifact. Just that Sirtha was interested in its retrieval. Well, much like commerce, a relatively direct correlation, much like commerce, this is something that actually more involves the mortal world than I gesture at the strangeness of Fermata. So, well, you may be speaking to just the right sort of, well, whatever I am. <laughs> I say people and you can hear the asterisk. <laughs> 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 uh Rimush casts a somewhat concerned look at Apatia and says, Will she be all right? Yes, I I imagine so. Um you you've caught us right as we've made a, a return from a distant land, so forgive us if we all seem a little bit fatigued. We're all weary, and she struggles with moderation, I point to my shoulder, but she's quite hearty, I assure you. <laughs> And says, it does seem that your travels were less auspicious than ours. And his gaze lingers on the bandages that you're wearing. Uh, Ia, noting that everyone has sort of finished their meal and their, their drinks, uh, says, perhaps we should look into lodgings for the evening. Um... I think we what have are the customs surrounding that. I think we have space enough at our place, uh, though with perhaps a word of caution that uh, the big they them L stairs does not exactly understand comfort. You, as you say, comfort. I will put out people. <laughs> <laughs> Both are entirely correct. Um, Softness and brightness. Remain struggles. But with that caveat, you're quite welcome. Alternatively, starting with... We could see to it that the Acolytes set you up with a place, or else we could find lodgings for you within the city, whichever you prefer. So starting in Lissa's statement with your phrase, the they, them, else stares... <laughs> Both Rimush and Ia look mystified <laughs> by this formulation, uh, though they kind of catch back up by the end of the, the combined sort of address. And Ia shoots a glance at Rimush and then back at Lissa and says, well, we will certainly go with whatever is most seemly according to local standards, but I think that according to our customs, being invited to stay in the palace of the rulers, and she just gestures to Dusk and Lissa, would be the most seemly thing, no? I nod. I, 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 I will nod as if... <laughs> Of course this is the case. I was simply, you know, offering you options in case that wasn't your case. Cough. <laughs> that which is most seemly is not always that which is most comfortable. So as hosts, we thought we would provide the full suite of options. But, again, you're very welcome. And we are happy to um, accommodate whatever needs your comfort may require. Indeed. You need only speak them. 
Uh, they both kind of graciously incline their heads and look at the table, uh, and uh, Rimush sort of somewhat awkwardly, the most awkward he's been, uh, his natural sort of physical act of, you know, action of being comfortable, uh, is, uh, you know, disrupted momentarily as he looks at the plates and glasses and says, what are the customs surrounding payment here? I... It's it's uh covered by me. We are your hosts. Um, however, most people decline my offers to pay them gratuitously here. As you say <laughs> that, I, or following on Lissa's words, as our hosts, or as your hosts, there is no need for you, our guests, to pay for your food or lodgings. They will be seen to. Again, a sort of grateful nod of the head, and Ia says, And the lodgings of our attendants, will there be room for them in the palace as well? Point of order, will there? Just have <laughs> and All of us thinking that thought. <laughs> so there is enough space. There probably aren't enough, like, appointed bedrooms, but you could get in beds, cots, bedrolls for it. If we're know, willing to go compliment. full Hierat, we can just have them sleep in the in the Great Hall kind of thing. You would probably convert, like, a couple of sitting rooms or something. Like the furnishings, the layout of the place is, according to a vague idea of what a human mansion is like, rather than any specific architectural plan dreamed up by a professional human in that trade. Yeah, so I think I, we convey this information and, and uh, just, you know, make sure that that is what they are expecting and accustomed to, and that if that if that is the case, then we can certainly accommodate them within, uh, within the... Uh, the aforementioned palace. They accept graciously uh, and uh, express uh, that they are tired from their travels, though it seems that you are probably much more tired from your travels uh, and uh, appreciate your hospitality, but that perhaps any further affairs of state that is the phrase that gets used, uh, should be conducted uh, after a good night's rest. I think that's entirely prudent. I, uh, I, I draw just a tiny bit of attention to Apatia, who I assume is still on my, her head is still on my shoulder. Uh, I also, mm -hmm. I also uh, after drawing attention to that, uh, catch Romnet's eyes and sort of gesture it, I'm sorry? Uh, <laughs> purely with eyebrows. I, there, there, there is a responding sort of. Oh no, this is not your fault. <laughs> I say that sounds like a swell idea, and suggest that we all head back to. And my, I briefly stutter over the phrase "my place," but and quickly adjust and say "our palace." <laughs> 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 neither is wrong uh yeah so your party decamps and as you move through the city toward your you know sort of mansion in uh the neighborhood of the manifestation slowly the entourage sort of trickles back into step behind uh ia and rimush who are once again walking arm in arm with Lissa. Uh, oh, okay. I was going to say, uh, were it not for that, and assuming a patient was still unconscious, I probably would have tried to offer to just carry her, but... <laughs> but your arms are occupied. She... My arms are otherwise yeah. occupied. She, when everybody kind of goes to move, Dusk, you're sort of like trying to like kind of very gingerly like maneuver, and she kind of comes awake and uh, says, oh, I'm terribly sorry. I... Guess I don't know my limits very well around here. It's um so dark, and she levers herself to her feet using Dosk's arm and shoulder, uh, and then uh sort of seems once you get out of uh the Obsidian Falcon to think, oh, uh, where should I stay if there is a place i suppose i am imposing aren't i, I? not at all you could stay with us <laughs> and once again 
the word me tries to force its way out, and I quickly adjust and say us. I'm just imagining an illustration of this uh, with you, you saying me with strike through, followed by us. In the text. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Doesn't quite come out me us, uh, but close. Sure. You, you see yeah, the, after- the my lips kind of curl around the first <laughs> syllable of me before quickly adjusting. <laughs> You, uh, it, upon hearing that, uh, Apatia, you know, sort of smiles big and, uh, wraps herself around Dosk's arm again, uh, and, uh, says, I'll admit, I was hoping you'd say that. Uh, and kind of, uh, looks at Dosk and says, lead on then. I lead on then. <laughs> yeah. You... Arrive a relatively short while later uh, at your, eh, you know, it doesn't look like a palace from the outside, but it might as well be. Real quick, do uh, I see any acolytes showing... on the way? Do we, do we, does the party see any acolytes on the way over? I'm actually going to roll for okay. that. You do not. Oh, okay. Uh, so... You arrive, you sort of push the doors open and show them in, uh, and, you know, the, the attendants are all very, uh, you know, sort of quiet in the back, but uh, almost as soon as everybody is in, as you are about to close the door behind you, uh, you see an acolyte has arrived to stand on the steps uh, of the uh, mansion and bows when, when you look at him. Timothy! And, <laughs> you know, I was much better about maintaining the them for acolytes before you named them Timothy. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm just uh, enjoying that. I'm, enjo- I'm enjoying the yeah, presence fine. of Timothy in our lives very much. <laughs> so, yeah, you start to get everyone settled in. It is a bit of a production. Uh, it's not too bad, uh, though. Uh, Pesha, for her part, uh, sort of falls asleep on the first sofa that she's set down on and seems to be fine there. Um, and Ia and Rimush are, are relatively um, easygoing uh, uh, with respect to their accommodations. Uh, a little bit reserved even compared to how they have been, just sort of observing everything and seeming to catalog it. Uh, the attendants are almost unnervingly quiet and subservient uh, as you sort of, you know, get them all settled as well. Uh, and as the last of the arrangements are made, Ia approaches Lissa specifically uh, to, to ask this may be a question that seems obvious to a resident of this place but how do you tell when it's morning and evening? I wish I had a good answer for you my lady Ia but it's something that I am still getting used to myself. She looks thoughtful and a little bit distant uh, at that, and then she kind of shakes her head a little bit and says, Please, you may just call me Ia. And uh, gives you a particularly warm smile uh, and says, I am afraid I must retire, but I hope we shall speak further tomorrow. This has been a very warm reception. I'll be honest, we were not sure how we would be received here as there has been very little contact between our regions and much less our gods in the last few centuries, as far as we can ascertain, but could not have asked for better hosts. And, you know, she sort of gives you one of those slight inclinations of the head, uh, and then leans in very close and whispers, as close to Lissa's ear as she can get on tiptoe. Um, tomorrow, we must speak privately of the sea. And then gives you sort of like a small wave as she backs off and heads toward her room. Of course, Ia. 
And I, I smile at her retreating back and say, like you, I'm sure I miss, uh, like you, I also miss the sun here. Um, she glances very briefly back at you, uh, but does not say anything as she uh, enters the room she's been given for the night. Um, anything in particular before bed? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, any other yeses there or before we get into it i guess point of order okay. point of logistics at what point sure. do we bid romnet adieu this evening i assume he goes back to his own lodgings rather than uh I staying at the palace probably see you all to the uh palace of principalities <laughs> I'm going to say that I say goodnight to Romnet on the steps of the Palace of Principalities. The, the Principalis, uh, if you will. The Principalis, <laughs> if you will, and I shall. How <laughs> dare you. <laughs> That's specifically for you, you've harmed. You've harmed the Hollyhock God. <laughs> um, no, and I, I, I say thank you again. And I feel the need to say I'm sorry again. Things never seem to get any simpler. I, I will say, after I kiss him goodnight, we knew what we signed up for. <laughs> so, Ramad heads back to his place, and Lissa, you had a yes, uh, that you had something in particular before bedtime. Uh, did a patient just crash on a random sofa? <clears throat> she did. <sighs> um, I I probably am going to check on her, and after considering to myself and perhaps consulting Dosk, um, I remember that there's probably a settee in my room because, of course, Lissa would have a settee. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, Part of the softness. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so I probably try to set her up on that with a proper pillow and a blanket without waking her. Indeed, she does not wake, although uh, at one point while you are carrying her, uh, she does drowsily lick the inside of your upper arm. Uh, That's perfectly appropriate. <laughs> She'll be neither the first nor the last. On, on the <laughs> uh, you get her settled on the settee, and uh, you know she d settles in without waking up. Uh, and in short enough order, everybody is probably pretty easily zonked out for the night. Um, Lissa, you sleep through the night blissfully. Uh, I mean, I say the night, it's always dark. You sleep uninterval, uninterrupted, dead asleep, borderline blissful. Uh... From that you find yourself un unexpectedly tired, uh, but you have a little bit less of an urgency to your rest. And this um, is why tomorrow, again, there will be coffee. Indeed. Uh, and both uh, Dusk and Lissa can lose whatever shock damage you have, as well as converting after that one killing to shock. And is, is that one killing... Period or one killing like per area like with like a I have killing damage both on my torso and my head. Do I pick one and convert it? You do. Gotcha. Cool. Cool. <laughs> you pick one killing damage to convert to shock, and then that will go away the next time you rest, and then you will convert another killing to shock, and so on and so forth. Presumably, also they lose um, their penalty dice. Yes, once they're awake, they will uh, be fully rested and lose the penalty die I've been assessing for you. Um, Dusk. You dream of Uncle Melly. It's fragmentary and not especially vivid, but there's him and a nighttime sea with a storm rolling in. There's some pungent odor. And you wake up seemingly after just having closed your eyes. Uh hearing Uncle Melly yell damn it boy uh, into this sea wind it's not exactly like a panic that you wake up in but he was just like loud enough in his shout uh, that like you kind of spring awake uh, you try to sit up but find that you cannot because uh, at some point while you were asleep uh, Apatia 
has come into your room and laid down, not just in your bed, but on top of one of your arms with her head on your shoulder. Uh, she rolls part way down your arm as you sort of jerk awake. You also have no idea what quote-unquote time it is because, well, it never really changes in terms of lighting, but the manner is still quiet to all, you know, immediate appearances. Are there any obvious signs that I've been relieved of any of my blood? <laughs> there are not. Okay. Presumably, if your uncle yelling at you in a dream had been enough to wake you up, then being bitten would have been enough to wake you up. Apatia can heal the wounds of her bite, uh, you know, afterwards, but every time she's bitten you so far, it has hurt quite a lot uh, when she did the biting. I think this is probably not a rational choice, but it's absolutely the choice that I would make as to ask. Mm -hmm. um, I jump into Uncle Melly's head just then to see okay. what exactly is going on with him. Okay. You jump into Uncle Melly's head. Uh, it is as disorienting as ever. He is mid-sentence. He's seated in a small, well, what was called closet in the tier manor. They are basically small rooms offering privacy for conversation games of strategy other pursuits two person pursuits um how conservative too that sure. the wealthy uh trading families get up to uh he is sitting in one of these across a small circular table from a woman you do not recognize who seems to be about his age roughly uh dressed in finery uh and she is sort of smiling triumphantly at him over a board of the you know, sort of ferret version of, like, chess or go. Uh, and he is looking kind of at her in the top of his uh, field of vision, the uh, board in the bottom of his field of vision. He looks to be losing. Uh, you can feel his frustration rising, as well as his teeth grinding uh, a little bit on the left side. Uh, and he is in the middle of saying something to her that your arrival has interrupted. He goes a little bit stiff and then finishes his sentence with just see about that, I suppose. She looks considering and his gaze sort of unfocuses a little bit as he tries to sort of probe your presence as you sort of interpret his response, although he doesn't have any particular spiritual avenue for doing that. I suppose my first thought is to see if I can address her as him and say, something strange is about to occur. Please don't judge the man you're looking at. You can indeed use his mouth to say that. Uh, and it's in his voice, but in your mannerisms. So it sounds odd even to his slash your ears. And as you are saying it, you feel his hand uh, against his forehead uh, and the woman cocks her head to one side and looks a little bit quizzical. This is going to sound strange. I'm sure it already sounds strange, but I had a dream that I disappointed you. Have I? <clears throat> Point of order, Adam. Does Dusk there recognize is... the woman yes. to whom Uncle Melly is speaking? Okay. Okay. I sort of assumed you would have said if I had. <laughs> she does not. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I would have. Yeah. Uh, there is a very pregnant pause. And then Uncle Melly in his own voice looks down into the side and says, Nephew, please take this the wrong way. <clears throat> You have disappointed me every day of your life, and none more than now. <laughs> Please leave. So status quo then. Very good. And I withdraw. <laughs> <laughs> you come back to your self 
to find that you are sitting up in bed with a little bit of a slick of sweat and Apatia sort of leaning up next to you, looking at you quizzically and kind of like stroking the back of your hand with one of her hands. Uh, and uh, she, upon seeing your eyes kind of like flutter open, says, where did you go? I've never asked. Can you enter other people, become them briefly? That's what I did. And, well, it seems that I'm (laughs) as frustrating as ever to the only person who's ever really looked out for me. She sort of, her brown knits in confusion, and she starts to parse everything going on in that sentence, and she says, I don't believe I've ever entered anyone. And then she kind of looks up and says, Do you think you could do it with me? I am entirely speechless for a moment. (laughs) Not knowing how this works in character, I try it. I try jumping into a patient's head. You feel vertiginous for a minute. And then there's a sensation like your soul is on a water slide for a long moment. <laughs> Though I guess Das probably wouldn't know what that feels like, so it's entirely baffling to him. Uh, before you find yourself looking out on a familiar ocean view from the highest point in the confluence. <laughs> <laughs> you are standing next to an unfamiliar acolyte. And hearing Verta's voice finish a sentence that ends with so I'm afraid I don't really have time for that right now he slash I I blurt out if you had any doubt you're still not crazy it's still me (laughs) hello (laughs) Ruta's whole body goes tense and stiff for a moment as the acolyte next to him sort of looks at him curiously and then says, I understand. I'll um, leave you to it then and backs out of your field of view. Uh, and you hear footsteps descending a stairwell. I call after him. It's Ruta's not hands. Ruta's fault. <laughs> <laughs> When you are done saying that, Ruta's mouth snaps shut with an audible click of teeth. And uh, his hands tense on the sort of stone railing of this highest balcony in the confluence. And through gritted teeth, he says, If I'm not crazy, then what the hell is going on? Well... There's actually a lot. I have, I think I said this and it wasn't helpful then either. I've become something more than just a a person, I suppose. Uh, there, you think about strange things all day. That's what we did at the confluence. It was, I miss it sometimes, but there are stranger things even than you've ever thought of. And I think I'm one of them now and we share a connection. We always shared a connection, but now... It's more than it was, I think, because I can be you sometimes. And yes, it's me, and no, you're not crazy. Verto laughs once and goes, You're not making a very good case for my sanity, Shuffle. When are you coming back? My first instinct is to say, Never. But without really thinking it through, I say, soon. (laughs) He sort of lets out a breath and says, I'll never understand why you left, but if you need to explain what's happened to you, please do it facing me and not using my body to speak to me. It's... 
he, he seems to cycle through a few choice phrases before he settles on. Very unpleasant. I pause a moment and I say, that's fair. And I withdraw again. <laughs> <laughs> you withdraw again to, uh, to Apatia having sort of like laid you down on the bed and sitting to one side, kind of looking down at you. And when you open your eyes, she says, I guess it didn't work. No, no, it didn't. It seems it's the same people every time. And, uh, well, so that's not something you can do then. She shrugs her shoulder and shakes her head. She says, not that I'm aware of. She looks off to one side and says, was I a problem last night? I don't remember it clearly. From waking up to coming here, I only have bits and pieces. I I hope I wasn't a bother. I don't think you were a bother. I, uh, I didn't have a way to express this. I didn't want to dampen your enthusiasm, which was vast and should be, by all means. But, uh, but Romnet, you met Romnet. Romnet and I are, we are important to each other, and you are very enthusiastic and affectionate and those are good <laughs> qualities in a person i just hope you don't take my wanting your your friendship and your comfort and your allegiance and your and your mutual understanding the wrong way because he and i we it's different i'm not making sense am i as you speak, her head slowly tilts to one side until it's at about 45 degrees. And when you're finished, uh, she sort of gives your like kind of forehead to the top of your head, like one kind of quick stroke and says, I can tell that you are important to each other, even from what I remember of last night, but the last thing I would want to do is, well, make it seem that I had any problem with that. I am not sure exactly what you were trying to say just now, but it's fine. I'm not offended. And she kind of pats you on the top of the head and stands up from the bed. I say uh, that's a relief. I think. And <laughs> thank you. And are you all right? Last night seemed unusual for you. She nods. She says, I think it was the blood. It was unusual. Uh, I, uh, which blood? She cocks her hand and says, oh, right. It never came up. The kind young woman who was taking care of me when I woke up. Uh, she was curious and offered me some of hers because I had gone a little while without. But um, there was something a little different about her blood. I don't know. It was very strange. I'll have to ask her. I'm going to try to see her today and figure it out. Although she looks out of your bedroom window and says, Is it day? This is very strange. Day is not precisely a native concept here. This woman, though, she, I mean, you, when you, her blood, you left her some. Yes? Oh, oh, yes. <laughs> she chuckles. She says, no, I, I maybe had more than a usual meal, but no, she, she has some left. She cocks her head at you. She says, I... I don't think she'd be all right if I didn't leave her some. I wouldn't do that to her. Good. Great. Yes. that's Your instincts are entirely correct there. Could you take me to her? Oh, I suppose, but, well, I thought you would be the one to guide me. She looks a little bit embarrassed. I'm sure we can work something out. And and morning, morning. Uh, it's I suppose if we're awake and we feel reasonably ready to fix our various 
doings, then yes, it's morning. Thank you for uh, nods. your candor and everything. And I hope I hope you feel safe here. And I look. Let's go. <laughs> she nods decisively, sort of straightens her Vermontan clothes a little bit, uh, and opens the door to your bedroom. And Ia is standing there with her knuckle raised like she was about to knock on it. Uh, and she sort of looks a little surprised and lowers her hand. Uh, I say good morning says, in audible air quotes. <laughs> she points once and says, Two of our attendants are missing. And that's where we'll end our session. Mm. So you can each have one mortal experience point. Oh. Hooray! <laughs> Next time, a murder mystery. I feel like I've solved it. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like we all have solved it. <laughs> it's a murder mystery called The Butler Did It. <laughs> In which a patient is the butler. Blood. I feel... Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, sure, the nun, the I, nun did I feel it. Like, <laughs> I feel like if it was called The Butler Did It, I would be suspicious of that conclusion. Fair. Uh, though yeah. it could be, you know, a uh, a double twist. Who knows? Uh, but yes, everybody gets one uh, mortal experience point. And um, yeah, it was... Uh, you know, not uh, let it, letting the the ebb and flow of the interactions guide this session, but figured that uh, with a hook for, you know, what we'd be getting up to next time was as good a place to end as any. And to keep you guys guessing as well. Uh, so, yes, we'll uh, commence uh, that morning uh, when we next play. But for the moment... That concludes this session of Dice Punks, so thanks for joining us. I hope our players and listeners enjoyed it as much as I did, and that you'll join us again next time. If you're hearing us now, then you probably know where to listen to this, but we can be found almost any place one can listen to podcasts, as well as on the wider web at DicePunks.com, and on Twitter as at DicePunks. With that, I think we're ready to say farewell, so say goodbye to the kind folks at home. Thanks for listening, and interpersonal drama is worth working out, but not at the expense of finding out whether one of your guests has drained another of your guests of most of their blood. Thanks for listening, everyone, and remember, if you're not great at tact or just diplomacy, sometimes <laughs> just being nice is the answer. <laughs> Thank you for joining us, dear listeners, and... Interpersonal drama is worth working out, particularly if you can do it during a conversation about other things with only your eyebrows. <laughs> <laughs> Truer words. And as the poet once said, the sun and moon are my father's eyes. Thank you, dear listeners, for tuning in and stick around through the admin stuff. There's a task fact waiting for you at the end of it. The songs in this episode, Theme of the Dice Punks and its acoustic version, were written and recorded by the regal of nothing himself, Drew. Cover art is by Joanne, illustrious spook mistress of our Halloween one-shot. Site design and graphics for DicePunks.com are by Robin, the player behind Lissa, the irrepressible Duchess of Fury. Rain and the one roll engine it runs on were created by Greg Stoltze, whose work can be found in a frankly astonishing number of cool places, but I'll point you toward GregStoltze.com. Nobilis was created by Jenna Catterin Moran and can be found alongside much of her other really intriguing work, both in and outside of tabletop roleplaying at afarandsunlessland.wordpress.com. Links to both systems and authors can be found on the punk grimoire section of our website, dicepunks.com. Thanks so much for listening. If you liked what you heard, well, that's rewarded off on its own, really, but if you're so inclined, you can help us out by rating and reviewing us wherever you listen to us, telling your friends who you think would like us to give us a listen, or even by heading over to our Patreon at patreon.com slash dicepunks. We have fun rewards available to backers, including a patron-only Discord and access to the Dice Peaks after show for episodes one and following. Regardless, we hope you'll tune in again, and until then, remember, subtlety is for cowards.
Romnet is awfully fond of coffee, and that got me thinking on the origins of the stuff. Now, you'd be forgiven, dear listener, for thinking that it's a beverage endemic to Fermata, forming as it does a surface of near-absolute darkness, and representing as it does the duality of the quiet and the riotous. But no, coffee is a familiar enough thing to the people of Taraxis, certain of them anyway. The inordinately wealthy ones, the ones who've known the privilege of encountering trade goods from beyond the Shadowed Lands. But in any case, the more I thought on this, the more old memories began to come back, and the more old threads began to connect. My grandfather, Creus's tear, back when we were still speaking, I mean, always held firm that not a single Taraxan, living or dead, had ever actually liked coffee. He thought that everyone thought of it the way he thought of it, that is, as a pure performance of worldliness and wealth. He called coffee a mistake few can afford to make. And indeed, he rarely referred to it as coffee, but rather as the prig's sacrament. As I said, threads connecting, I realize now that I once knew an Aleph sister at the confluence who considered coffee an actual sacrament. She cornered me in the library and went on about how, yes, she knew I'd given up my old identity, as had we all, but even so, did I perhaps know where one could acquire some of, this in a hushed tone, that dram that plays havoc with time? I told her I was fairly certain that coffee, if indeed we were talking about coffee, didn't actually change the flow of time, but this only set her off about the actual nature of actuality. Not coincidentally, as you may recall, I left that place. Beyond any of that, though, I learned somewhere or other that some strange souls drink their coffee hot. I'm not sure Romnet would believe me if I told him that. But it's a Dosk fact. <laughs>